Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. We are just over a week away from the NHL entry draft, and we finally filled out the Flames hockey operations staff. I'm Dan, alongside Matt. Um, Matt, this is going to be quite a full episode for us today. Yeah, quite a lot to talk about, and uh, congratulations to the Vegas Golden Knights for winning the Stanley Cup. They've Always done like what? throwing that in there. So. Two cups in six years, and we've had one in 30? Yeah. Uh, well, they went to the finals the, the one time. They didn't win. Oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah but the, I, that's kind of what I meant. They've Yeah, they played for Lord Stanley's mug. Yeah. So but, yeah, we, it's been a we long gotta time. we got to catch up. Yeah. Well, you go back to 89, like, yeah, it's like 30, what, four years now, and one appearance in the finals. So, yeah, the Flames need to step it up. Well, talking about stepping it up, they now have a new head coach who can help them with that. On June 12th, Ryan Huska was named the Flames head coach, the 19th head coach in history. Um, and I think this is a name that a lot of people thought was going to be in the conversation. Uh, Craig Conroy had said that they had 15 guys that he wanted to talk to and then narrowed the list down to four. Love was one of those four, and Ryan Huska was one of them. Um, it's interesting to hear Ryan, to hear Craig Conroy talk about this hire. He said that when Huska came to um, his interview, he had both a PowerPoint and video to back up his interview. So you can tell the guy is very prepared. But Matt, what do you think of Ryan Huska being named the coach? Uh, this is exactly the type of coach that the Flames needed post Sutter. Um, he's very much a personable guy, uh, very well liked in general. Um, a guy who actually responds to the players and gives feedback in a respectful manner, uh, which after what happened with Daryl, I think the team needed uh, somebody that was more, uh, not necessarily a player's coach, but more, um, a better communicator, frankly. And Ryan Huska has always been an extremely good coach when it comes to uh, defensive systems and um, coaching young defensemen. Uh, the players that he coached in junior, uh, right through to guys like Rasmus Anderson who have re- and Oliver Shillington, who have really blossomed into quality NHL players. And Anderson's under talked him. recently about his first year coming in, you know, out of shape, and uh, and how Huska helped him get there. Yeah. And it's one of those where I think it's important to have um, somebody who is very good at a particular skill set, whether, you know, in this particular case, working with defensive minded players. Um, Like even last season, the only group that really didn't struggle throughout the season was the defense core. Um, the forwards and the goaltending were abysmal, but the defense was pretty much consistently okay to good. Um, so, like, if he can figure out how to get the forwards and the goaltenders back in line um, with the defense, then I think that this could be a big step for the Flames to have a rebound season. I agree. Huska has been a head coach since 2007-8 when he was head coach in Kelowna all the way through 17-18, so 11 seasons. And has been an assistant coach with the Flames since 2018-2019. Matt, here's an interesting thing you may not know about Ryan Hoskins. You know he's never been fired. How many coaches have never been fired? That's a neat stat. Yeah, so he went from Kelowna. He was head coach. Technically, he never got fired. He got hired away by the Flames, but was never you know, fired from his job. And then went from the Stockton Heat to being hired by the Flames for an assistant job and now just keeps getting promoted up the ladder. So I think that's kind of a neat stat because we've always said coaches are hired to be fired. Yeah. This guy is not. Yeah, that's a very neat stat. And I'm just hopeful that uh, he does a very good job this year. Um, you know, like on the flip side, like you do not want to see a situation where, you know, like he gets labeled as like the next gym Playfair. Where, uh, like, uh, Playfair, he was hired in the 6 07 season, never had any NHL coaching experience. The team struggled in due in part to him, but not entirely. And then, uh, yeah, the team uh, struggled and failed uh, in the playoffs, and he hasn't had a head coaching job since then. And, 
you know, that... And, you know, I mean, Gullitson a lot the same, though. I think some guys are destined to be better assistant coaches than head coaches, and I guess time will tell if Husk is one of those guys. Yeah, like, that's the downside. If he doesn't isn't able to switch over, um, then the, it could be a situation like that. But with how well he was a head coach in Kelowna and then in Stockton, I don't think that that will be an issue we will have no. to wait and see, though. And a big, I guess, a big cha- you know, difference between them. If we look at uh, Huska and Playfair, uh, Playfair was head coach for the Dayton Bombers, the ECHL, for three years, and the St. John's Flames for three years, so six years. Huska's got 11 years head coaching. So, I mean, he's got more time there under his belt, and he also has every year that he was head coach in Kelowna, they made it to the playoffs. So he's also got a lot more playoff experience there as well. Yeah. Um. Interesting to note here that Huska and Conroy said they will work together to determine the next captain for this team and that Huska is going to have to build his own coaching staff. And obviously Huska now leaves a void in the assistant coach group, but the way that it's been talked about, it sounds like they might be looking for more than one guy. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see a big change here in the next little bit. But the name that I think a lot of fans were hoping for in this role was Mitch Love, who's been the coach of the uh, the Calgary Wranglers. I said it right this time. Um, since they came here, and even last year when they were in Stockton, do you feel like during this process, fans may have been overrating Mitch Love just because he's had such AHL success in two years? Uh, perhaps. Um, it's one of those where... Uh, I see a lot of similarities in terms of preparedness between Love and Huska. So it might just be a situation where you have two very similar guys and you you give priority to the guy who's got more experience. And like they're both in the same situation. They're both very good at their jobs, respectively. And, you know, I think that realistically the flames should make mitch love an assistant coach if not like uh an associate coach um where you know like you're giving him like a good boost in his career so that way you know um you're promote giving him a major promotion and see where he goes and i can see that but i can also see for one year more keeping him in the ahl like he's had great success um I could totally see saying, you know what? We'd rather keep you as a head coach in the American League so you can work on that head coaching part. Yeah, it's one of those that I'm concerned with losing him to another team. I think you could lose him either way, though. Yeah. I know. It's How would you say it's more that um, more likely that he would be loyal to here if he was promoted up the ladder versus... Yeah. yeah, but I think either way, whether you're an assistant coach, an associate coach, or an HL head coach, if an NHL team calls, you're going to jump. Oh, for sure. So we'll it, see what happens yeah. there. I think, though, if they're looking to hire a coach, I'd rather they go with a guy with a little more NHL experience. Sort of like the Dave Nonis, Craig Conroy situation. And, you know, I'll tell you right now, Matt, my strong uh, feeling is we may be looking for a one-year placeholder before Jerome McGinley joins that staff next year. I agree. And talking about Jerome McGinley, he's been brought into the Calgary Flames as a part-timer this year uh, as a special advisor to the GM. He'll still be working in uh, Kelowna, where he is right now, with his son in their uh, hockey program that they're working on, and then it's expected he'll join full-time. Jerome's a guy who's had success coaching, and he's doing a good job where he is. I don't think you bring this guy in ultimately as an AGM or something like that. I think he's had such success coaching, you keep him on the coaching staff. Whether that means the head coach for the Wranglers, whether that means an assistant coach for the Flames, I think he's showing he's a good development coach with the young guys he's working with. Head coach for the Hitmen, though I doubt it. Um, but I strongly, I would be shocked if this time next year, Jerome McGinley is not either on the Flames or the Wranglers staff. Yeah, I agree. And uh, with Aginla, I think that it makes a lot of sense to have him as at least some sort of role, if not as a coaching staff member, uh, you know, like uh, basically filling what Conroy's job was initially with Treliving. And, uh, you know, Aginla will definitely have the ability to, you know, like if he wants to be a coach in the NHL, 
you know, like you look at Martin St. Louis, all he had to do was say, Hey, I'd like to coach for Montreal and okay, cool. Um, again, was that level of respected as well where, you know, and it makes entire sense that the flames are the ones to give him the first shot. Um, I think that he very much could be a high quality assistant coach next year if he wants to, or if he wants to be in the front office, I think it's really entirely up to him. You just know that Conroy is going to be bugging the him repeatedly all year anyway so you know you might as well get paid for it <laughs> and you know i i saw somebody already talking online about how they think huska is a placeholder for a year until jerome becomes the head coach no. i think that would be the wrong move you don't bring jerome in never having professional hockey coaching experience to be your head coach right now for the flames i think you know, I think he'll get there, and I can definitely see that being his ultimate sort of landing place, but I don't think it happens yet. I think you bring him in as either your AHL head coach or your uh, assistant coach in the National Hockey League, and you make him work his way up. Yeah, the only realistic way that you could do that is if the Flames were in complete teardown rebuild mode like Montreal, where, hey, let's have a Hall of Fame forward be our head coach but even then i think we have guys like huska and love who you want to give that shot to i know and that's pretty much like the only situation where i could envision again becoming the flames head coach in a sooner than later situation as if like they're just in rebuild mode and hey this is some excuse to get fans to come to the building to see again behind the bench that kind of thing um, yeah, and I, I mean, you'll still see him behind the bench either way. But I yeah. think, he, you know, the only thing is uh, if they want to do that, I think you make him more like Conroy was, where he's you're sort of your assistant to the GM, but also your public face. And Conroy's still out doing a, a lot of work in the community and that sort of thing. So I think that might, if you feel you need that, be the best landing spot for Jerome. Yeah, and I think that there's not really any bad answer uh with what to do with Jerome McGinley um you know it literally whatever he wants to do I think that the Flames should be more than willing to accommodate other outside of like maybe the head coaching job right away you know and I think Jerome's (laughs) smart enough he's not going to go and ask for that like I think that's you know sort of a, a Flames fan's dream um, of seeing that, you know, let's bring in Tangay, let's bring in Camilleri, let's reunite our 4 team behind that bench. Um, then we can be back in the Dome chilling with Jerome, but that's really just, that's not the right way to go right now. Yeah, exactly. Like, this team needs to sort out the off-ice and on-ice issues that they've had and, you know, build forward instead of, you know, trying And even to- when you talked about, you know, Jerome being behind the bench, I would not be surprised... I don't think as much this year, but next year if he's on the coaching staff, there's times when we saw this last year, Daryl Sutter didn't come talk to the media, he sent an assistant. And I wouldn't be surprised if Jerome was really the voice of the uh, of the coaching staff if he's on it. Yeah. He's well-spoken. He does well with the media. I think Huska's well-spoken, but I don't think Huska's as engaging as Jerome is. So I could see him being the guy that does the media calls. Yeah. Well, Huska's very analytical and extremely intelligent so you know he comes off more uh, um a little bit more professorial in his diction um professor huska hockey professor yeah where um you know again is you know also very intelligent and all that but more used to engaging with you know, media and fans yeah. due to his career. And I think, especially after a hard night, Jerome's going to get less crap from the media than Huska would. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, the guys here still love him. So anything else about the, I guess, the front office changes that we've seen that you want to talk about before we move on? No. I think we still have at least one assistant coach to bring in. I wouldn't be surprised if we see two or three of them changing um, in the next little bit here. But I think, you know, those are names I'm not going to spend a lot of time getting into because we really don't know exactly what they're looking for there, who they might want to move out, that sort of thing. Yeah, but I that, would, that stuff's I, all I, usually sorted out in July anyway. Uh, yeah. And August. Once, so. once other coaches are out of contract or that sort of thing. Yeah. So no, no real point in going into that too much. 
And but I would like to see them bring in somebody a little more senior, sort of like the Dave Nonis to Craig Conroy, maybe a former head coach or a guy who was a one-time head coach, somebody to help balance out uh, Huska a little bit. Mm-hmm. So and you know a bunch of our guys do have uh, contracts expiring this year for assistant coaches, so maybe it's like you know I, I'm I'm just gonna make up a name here. I don't know. Kirk Muller's on for one more year, and then Jerome replaces him, or Kale McLean, or. Uh, something like that. But I I think that we know who next year one of those assistants will be. And even, even you know, you said Jerome playing a Conroy-like role. There were times Conroy was on the ice. I remember um, seeing him on the dome ice years ago helping guys with face-offs. So I bet uh, Jerome will be on the ice, and I wouldn't be surprised even if we see him at the, at the rookie uh, development camp on the ice with some of these guys. Yeah. Because he is working as a, a development coach right now. Yeah, and the team certainly could use somebody to instruct how to exactly rifle those shots to the top corner. Well, and I think, too, for a lot of these guys, Jerome was the guy they grew up watching, right? I mean, they don't know who Lanny McDonald is anymore or some of the guys that we grew up watching. So I think if you're on the ice with your idol, that's going to be say something about, oh, yeah, I want to come here. You're saying we're old, Dan? <laughs> I am. We, You know, you ask some of these kids who... Uh, Poplinski is or Bearzan or Hunter or Vernon. They're not going to have any idea. True. But that's the guys we grew up watching. Um, well, the the next group of guys that we'll grow up watching, or I guess we've already grown up, but that'll be the players taken in the 2023 entry draft. And that's where we'll spend most of today's shows talking about the draft. Um, it's It's an interesting draft year. And this year, the Flames have a first round pick at least as of right now, and it's the 16th pick. So what Matt and I have done is we've each gone out and picked a couple players that will profile. Matt's pick three, and I pick two. And we'll talk about these guys for the Flames' first-round pick at 16, and then we'll have some other discussions around that pick and later picks after that. So, Matt, do you want to start off with your first guy here? Well, I just want to preface that this draft is a little bit unusual. Um, With the Flames picking at 16, usually the quality of player is a little inconsistent. Um, at that draft pick range, uh, but this year's that's the last lottery pick. Yeah, Th- this year's draft though is a lot more deep than the past like five or six drafts. Really, um, like in past years, the guys that are going to go fourth and fifth overall would have been number one overall picks, uh, except for like the Matthews and McDavid draft. You can keep going back, and like those guys are at that level of talent. And then it cascades down. So, like, the guys that would be, like, 6 to 10 would be, like, the 2 to 5 guys in a normal draft. So, like, there is a huge amount of quality in this draft. And that cascades down to 16, where the Flames are picking 16th, but they're going to get a guy who, under normal circumstances, probably would have went 8th or ninth in the draft. Uh, there's a ton of quality. And... Um, and teams knew this, and we saw a lot of teams not trading their first-round picks this year because they knew that they were going to want to make this pick. Yeah, like even when it comes to the second-round pick uh, with the Flames picking at 48, like that should still be a fairly reasonable quality player, like a guy that would have been in the 31 to 35 range. Um, so like it, it's a very good draft and very forward-heavy which with the Flames needing forward scoring help, it, it the need and wants kind of fit like a glove. Well, we'll look at five players here. The first three are Matt's selections for 16, and let's start with your number one, and that's Oliver Moore, playing out of the University of Minnesota in the NCAA. He's an 18-year-old from Minnesota. He's five foot 11, 176 pounds, left-shot centerman. What do we like about Moore? Uh, he is... Virtually a clone of Matthew Coronado. Uh, everything that everybody likes about Coronado, his speed, his shot, his tenacity. Um, the only main differences are that Moore is taller at nearly 5'11", um, and he's a left-handed shooter to Coronado's right. Um, very much a sniper, uh, good motor on him. Pretty much everything that the Flames would be looking for in a top six forward. Uh, he's currently rated in the 12 to 13 range, give or take, depending on... I've seen him rated as high as 7 and as low as 17. Yeah, so it's one of those where it uh, just depends on 
you know, he could slide to 16. Do I realistically expect him to? Not really, but, it, you know, it wouldn't be a shock either if he did. I think Moore is a guy who, you know, at 16, you're not expecting him to turn pro right away. And going, the fact that he's committed to the uh, University of uh, Minnesota, this is a guy that I could see spending three or four years, sort of like Johnny did, in the college system. You get those rights for a little bit longer. But I think, you know, this is a guy that you, if they do take him, you shouldn't expect to see in the NHL or AHL this year or next year. Yeah, it basically would follow the same uh, development path that Coronado has, where, you know, spending a couple of seasons in the NCAA and then basically ready to step into the NHL once he's through that section of his development. The next guy you want to talk about is not a college prospect. It's Nate Danielson, who's playing for the Brandon Wheat Kings. He's a six foot one, 187 pound center. He's a right shot, listed as a centerman right now. Um, he's from Red Deer, so uh, I guess a somewhat local boy. And uh, he's played for the Wheat Kings now for th- this will be his third season, and he's their captain this year. Tw- 78 points at the WHL level. What do you like about Danielson? Uh, he's not the fastest guy, but he's not slow either. Uh, but he plays bigger, and um, he is a another good shooter. And the best comparison that I have for Flames fans would be a Tyler Toffoli style guy, where like he can hit, he can forecheck, uh, and he can also snipe the puck when given a good pass. So uh, very similar makeup overall. One thing I like about him from the little bit I've seen him in the WHL is he seems to play well without the puck on a stick, which a lot of WHL forwards don't. And he seems to know what to do with the puck off a stick. He's also a guy who has no problem battling. And I think, you know, that's something that you're going to need, especially as a bigger Flames forward. I think this guy's not... I would say this guy's probably more in a Michael Backlund vein and that you're not bringing him in to be your top sniper, but probably more of a playmaker, less defensive than Backlund. But I don't know if you kind of get what I'm going there, but I think a lot of people thought Backlund would come in and be this sniper. I don't think Danielson is that, but I think he could be a great setup man or sort of a, a bit of a two-way forward for for another guy. Yeah, uh, and I think that he has enough tools all the way around that he you could slot him anywhere up and down the lineup. And... Yeah, this is the kind of guy that I think down the road you could see as the, you know, center to Coronado or something like that. Yeah, it it would literally just depend on what facets of his game takes that next step as he matures, uh, which is always a bit of a crapshoot with every prospect. But based on all of the things that we've both seen of him, um, the IQ level of the player seems to be sufficient enough both when he has the puck and when he doesn't that regardless of whether the rest of the tools advance he will be a player in the nhl and a quality player and just uh whether he's a first liner if his shot and everything develops to its fullest extent or a reliable good uh third line guy like a blake coleman that just depends on how he develops And I think he has a little bit of everything in that you could probably develop a new into whatever you want him to be. Mm -hmm. Like he can do a little bit of everything. And the flames could move him in whatever direction they want. Um, He's, he's already NHL sized at six, one at 18. So, um, you know, I think that's going to be attractive to a lot of teams again. And I'll preface this now. I don't think the flames would turn any of these guys pro next year. Like, you know, they're all young players. I think all these guys will benefit from, at least some more junior or college time. So don't expect any of them to be in the NHL next year. But I think the Danielson, when he's ready, probably more so than a lot of the guys we're talking about would be the easiest to step into the NHL. Yeah. Like realistically this year's draft, uh, only um, the top two guys uh, should go um, Bedard and Fantilli. There's always uh, a couple teams that do it as more of a marketing thing of, Hey, come buy tickets and see our guy. Yeah. But, like, for realistic, uh, for how good they are and where they're at, uh, yeah, those are the only two that should be in the NHL. Um, everybody else uh, would probably be better off with a year or two or more uh, with developmental curves. So, um, with uh, most of the forwards, unfortunately, in the whole group from about 8 through 20, 
Uh, most of the forwards are under six feet tall. Um, only uh, Danielson and uh, Matthew Wood are on the taller side, and Wood is not very good. So, Wood not good. That sounds like a t-shirt. Yeah. Maybe that's all you write in your coaching notes yeah. or your scouting notes. Wood not good. Um. You know, and I think here, like, I don't want to say the same type of player, but there's a lot of talk right now that Elias Lindholm may not be back. We won't discuss that right now. But I think, you know, a guy like Danielson, who's good in the dot, who's good off the off the puck, I think this is a guy you could potentially look at as down the road, filling a lot of the same things that Lindholm brings this team. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you and I will talk a little bit about that after we profile the uh, draft picks that we're interested in, but yeah, I do agree with you there. Uh, the next guy that you had for us is, uh, Gabe Perot, another Canadian. He has both Canadian and American citizenship from Sherbrooke, uh, Quebec. He's 18, 5'11", 165 pounds. He played for the U S national team, uh, U 18 last year. And I believe he's uh, going to play one more year there. So what do you like about Perot? Uh, he is a shifty dynamite little uh, scorer, um, very quick. He's got great hands. Yeah, he, he just is a dynamic forward. Uh, the best comparison that, that I have listed for him is Clayton Keller. And very similarly, uh, how fast that they process the game and are able to take advantage of uh, defenses and goaltenders that aren't necessarily prepared for certain types of shots or certain types of passes. And just a very good dynamic all-around forward. And if fans recognize that name, it's because his dad, Yannick Perot, was in the NHL for a long time. He played for L.A., Toronto, Montreal, Nashville, Phoenix, Chicago, so... Um, a second generation NHL. Yeah, here. we profiled his older brother a few years ago. Uh, Jacob or Jeremy, one of the two. Yeah, it was uh, during the Peltier draft. Okay, we have Jacob, Jeremy, and then I guess Gabe is the the one who didn't get the J name. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I, I think so. This we'll be just call him Jabe coach. then. There you go. Um, I've seen him profiled everywhere from as high as about fifteen to as low as 27. So this is a guy who I definitely think will fall where the flames are. Um, he's, I would say, more of a playmaker from what I've seen. Mm-hmm. I agree. Um, but one thing he's really good at is keeping the puck on his stick and being able to draw four checkers. Like he's, from what I've seen, he's good at getting defensemen out of positions and drawing that checker towards Yeah, him. and that's a very good guy to have um, to for zone entries, which is something that the team has been missing since Gaudreau. Um, There's just lots of little things uh, that uh, Perot does that are just uh, everything that you're looking for from a top six forward. So those are the three guys you brought to the table. And I have two guys here that I want to chat about as well. Um, two guys that I, I would like the flames to take here. Another one is a guy who is exactly six foot plays for the Moose Jaw Warriors right now out of Saskatoon. And that's Brandon Yeager. Uh, he's, a, he's a right shot centerman, six foot, 165 pounds profiled to go anywhere between about number seven is the highest I've seen all the way down to 33. Um, I'll, I'll give here for fans who may not know Yeager, the elite prospects, 2023 draft guide summary of him. The puck absolutely explodes off his stick, no matter how compromised his body position appears to be during release. He rips it off either leg in in, in the same way. Two-touch, one-timer, and catch and release. His inside leg wrister is a signature shot, tipping his weight over just over the outside edge while somehow keeping his chest up and exploding through the shot. He takes every single puck directly into a shooting pocket, preparing for the next play. I like this kid because from what I can see from him, he's a very smart player. Um, he's the alternate for the Moose Jaw Warriors. He has 78 points. Definitely much more of a, I would say, this past year, a setup man than your score. I mean, his first year in the, or second year in the WHL, he had 34 goals, 25 assists. This year, 28 goals and 50 assists. But this is the kind of guy who I think can can straddle between those roles, between setup man, between a scorer, and a very smart young man. Yeah, I agree. And he was right there on my list as well um like if the 
there was uh say five or six guys on our list he was number four on mine so yeah. like he was right there um i have no problem with the anchor i think he he if the flames selected him that would be a dynamite pick like i don't think more will be available i think yeah. danielson jaeger and perot are probably the three guys that you're looking at from this list of being available when the yeah, flames get there i agree um, but yeah, I, I really like Jaeger. I think that he would, I, you know, I, I think there's something to be said about, you know, drafting the local kid too. I'll look at Saskatchewan as local since they have no NHL team, but I, I like him as a kid and I think he's a hard worker and I'd love to see him come in here. Yep. And the last you guy just that need to I make sure that he wears number 68. So anybody who has a Jaeger jersey can repurpose it. Spelled a little bit differently, but yeah, I don't even know if I'm saying that right. I imagine I am Jaeger, yeah. but yeah, it's, uh. It's spelled spelled differently. Yep. It's like what people tried to do with their uh, nineteen Kachuk Huberto ten. Yeah, there's been some hack jobs with those jerseys. Yeah, always fun. <laughs> so yeah, it, it'll be. I I don't I don't even know what number he wears right now, but I think nineteen. I, I could be so nineteen will be available. Yep. Uh, twenty nine. Yeah. So that's Dubay's number, but yeah. Um. Yeah. It's. I don't think it wears sixty eight, but I know where you're going with that. Yeah. And the last guy here, the first real non-North American on our list um, that I wanted to bring up is Otto Stenberg out of Sweden. He's a 5'11", 181-pound left winger. Um, he plays both center and wing. This is a guy who's profiled to generally go a little bit lower than where the Flames are, anywhere between 17 and 29. Some even have him as low as 36, so I don't think he'll be probably the Flames' first choice, but I like this kid as a possibility and could potentially fall though. I doubt it into the second round, depending on where we are. Yeah. It, this um, is a, a player that like, if the flames had a second first round pick in the 23 to 25 range, then like Stenberg would be like number one on my list. And the reason I put Stenberg in there and I'm not saying they would, but potentially if the flames, if the other guys are taken, yeah. I could see maybe moving down a couple spots and taking Stenberg. Yeah. Um, he's offensively gifted. He's got quick hands and an accurate shot. He's playing in a, he played for Sweden at the U 18s. And I believe he's playing in a men's league right now, which is always, I find those Swedish guys have a different development curve because of it, but he's a complete player. He has a good work ethic. Um, versatile enough to play center wing. There's a lot of things to like about this guy. I agree. If the flames were picking lower in the draft or had a second pick, like he would be right mm -hmm. near the top of my list. For sure. And Matt, all five of our choices here, all forwards, and you mentioned it. I mean, it's a very forward-heavy draft. There are a number of defensemen in this draft, but uh, there's only one guy that, especially because of the Flames, uh, with losing uh, Gaudreau and Kachuk, like, they don't really have any dynamic forwards upcoming in their organization outside of Coronado. Um, so... To me, like especially with the Flames defense group being all like twenty four to twenty eight, except for Tanev, uh, you buy yourself a little bit of time to need. Another. Yeah, like we don't it like it, it while defense men are a, a need for the team, it's not as urgent as the forwards, and the forwards tend to develop quicker um, to hit their fullest potential. Um, so it to me it just makes more sense in this draft to go forward. Uh, but there is one defenseman that actually, like, if he is available at 16, would actually be my number one pick out of all of the players, and that's Axel Sandin Paterka, or I can't remember the third name. Axel Sandin? Okay, yeah. and why him? Uh, he, he, his skating is, uh, bizarrely immaculate, um... The only guy I've seen skate in the manner that he does is Kale McCarr. And when he has guys pressuring him, he is so evasive and able to shake the, uh, the oncoming attackers and create space for himself. Then you add in that his offensive uh, instincts are top notch. Like, it's. He, to me, like, he. I think that this is, guy is going to be a superstar in the NHL. I don't think he'll be available at 16. No, and that's, yeah. I think he'll be a top 10, if not just a, just after. Yeah, I agree. And 
Uh, he's pretty much the only defenseman that I would consider taking instead of a forward. I think Button has him rated with TSN as high as five. Yeah, and I can agree with that. Like, I, you know, I would not... Like, if the Flames were picking seventh or eighth, like, uh, that would be... Yeah, go for this guy. So, um, I, I think, you know, because I've seen ratings with him all over the place as well. Um, much like all the rest of the guys uh, were, like, from seven to 25, I think. So, but with his skating ability... Um, that's what caught me, um, uh, more so than any of the other defensemen, just cause the only other guy I've literally ever seen skate like that is Makar and we see how good he is in the NHL. So this time of year, um, if anyone's interested, elite prospects does a really good job of so kind of taking all the experts and where they rank these guys and putting them in one place. So I'm just looking at, uh, Sandine's profile. His highest is five by Craig Button. And his lowest looks like it's 17 by Bob McKenzie. Yeah. But Bob McKenzie's out of the game, so maybe he's a little rusty. Yeah. It, it's literally just the footwork. And especially when it comes to goaltenders, like you can pretty much tell who will be a good goaltender uh, based on their footwork. Um, it, the defenseman, like it, when you see something that's that much out of the norm, it, it stands out. And that's why uh, Sandine uh, jumped to the forefront of uh, when I was uh, w viewing him. But, um, yeah, th the rest of the defensemen are similarly okay um, in the draft. I think you'll see the Flames take a defenseman probably in, the, in their – they don't have a third-round pick, but either second or fourth because they need some D in the system. Yeah, I would expect the, the second-round pick unless – one of the good forwards falls to them. I am expecting a defenseman in the second round, but uh, yeah, the, the that would be literally the only guy I would use the first round pick on a defenseman with is Sandine. Everybody else, like it should just be go with the best forward available. And while we're talking about that second round, um, well, actually, let's not get there first yet, but let's finish talking about this first round pick. Do you think there's any? urgency this year for the flames to explore moving up or moving down um if they really like a guy at, at 16 and the same situation with connor zari where you know that the teams are picking 17th and 18th aren't wanting that guy and neither is the team 19th and 19 wants to throw you a pick sure but unless that exact scenario happens they shouldn't trade down and realistically it doesn't make sense to trade up either no i think that there's such a glut of talent i mean i think that the cost to get into the top 10 this year is going to be astronomical i don't think they want to pay that cost from 11 to 16 i think that there's a whole bunch of forwards there and you're happy with any one of them so i don't see any reason to pay the cost to move up yeah the only th thing that i would like to see is the flames acquiring additional first round draft picks one or more and we'll talk We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a little yeah. bit here. Well, like that would be basically the only situation I could see, um, like where you know, like a pick involving the Flames happens, is uh, with us adding, not not trading down. Yeah, but it, let's just take that sixteenth pick. No. I don't think moving that sixteenth pick up is worth the cost. And like you said, I think the Zari scenario is a great one to move down a little bit if you're. You know, maybe you've got one guy or two guys and you know they'll be available. Sure, pick up an asset there. But I don't think, even then, I don't think you'd want to move much outside of the teens. Like, I think you could... Yeah, well, it, it's like, say, like, they really love Gabe Perot for whatever reason. And they know that he's not going to end up going until, like, 22nd. If they can trade down and still get Perot... Yeah. See, then sure. And like even then, I think even when the Flames did the Zari thing, they moved down what three spots, uh, and then two more. But you had kind of had to do it one at a time, like it was a series of oh, small yeah. trades. I don't know. You could move, yeah. In the, in a draft like this, I don't know. You can move up. I don't want to move much into the twenties, and I don't think anyone's going to drop that far out of sequence. No, I agree. Like I could see definitely going, you know, sixteen to eighteen or sixteen to nineteen. But I think in a draft like this, you want to stay in the teens. Yeah. It, the only uh, 
it just really depends on like if the flames have a certain fixation on a certain player and they know in the, the exact same yeah. situation and, and i don't Zari know thing. in a draft like this that you do i think that there's so many guys you want yeah. and with a new gm i think you're probably going to stick with the script yeah i agree so let's talk about the other rounds for the Flames then. And as of the time we record this, and it could change, but as of our recording on June 20th, the Flames have the first round pick, their second round pick. They do not have a third round pick that was traded to Seattle last year for Kelly Yarncroak. They have their fourth round pick, but not their fifth round pick that was traded to Montreal for Tyler Toffoli. Their sixth round pick and their seventh round pick. This feels like the most picks the Flames have gone into a draft with in a long time. I know, which five is not really enough either, but... I think I think that know. they can wrangle some up, which again, we'll talk about in a little bit, but um, we won't get into who the Flames should take in two through seven, because honestly, I don't think a lot of our listeners care, you know, who the Flames take with the seventh pick, but I think when we look at what type of player they should pick, they to me, they need two things. You've always said they need to take a goalie every year, which I would agree with, and I think as we look at Wolf potentially turning pro, we need the next guy in the system. Um, and I definitely think the Flames need to spend at least two picks on defensemen. Yeah, I agree. Uh, for me, the way I would break down the, the draft would be forward D, forward D, goalie. So you're thinking you'd go forward in round one, D in round two, forward in round four, D in round six, and then a goalie. And yeah. I think six and seven are pretty interchangeable as well. Yeah, exactly. The, the, that's uh, whomever is available and makes sense. You know, like, is that player going to be available on the next round? Sure. Yeah, I, I think sixth, in a draft then. like this, it probably makes sense. Take your goalie late, like seven. Um, and yeah. I would even be okay if the Flames did like round one, uh, forward two and four defensemen, six a forward and seven a goalie. But I yeah. think you need to walk out of this with at least two D men. Like our our defensive prospect cupboard is shallow. Yeah, well, realistically, it's only Kuznetsov and Poirier. Yeah, Soloviev and is like not going to make it. Uh, D Simone Malosha. I mean, Malosha is a free agent. Poolman, I don't think so. NHL or he's twenty seven. Yeah. Like, all of those guys are firmly in the meh category after uh, the two legit guys that they have. And the, there's no real other prospects in the system. So, like, the the Flames do need... Thankfully, they do have a whole bunch of guys that are in the 24 to 28 age bracket where, you know, like, frankly, like, the next four drafts, they're pretty much okay if they don't get a, another young guy upcoming. But it, it will get more of a priority the further away from today you get. Yeah, and I think, you know, even if we're not drafting a top guy, you know, I think we can find our, I'll use Walker Dewar as the forward example. I know we didn't draft him, but maybe our Martin Pospisil, like those guys that are strong, I think, contenders for a, a bottom pair job, like I think Pospisil or Dewar is for a third, fourth line role in the NHL. And I think at a, you know, six round pick, that's all you're expecting there. And if the guy busts, no big deal. It's a six round pick. Yeah. And, you know, like uh, you look at a guy like Josh Manson, who is a six round pick uh, with Anaheim. You know, like it, he was basically just drafted because of the fact that he's big and, you know, he managed to develop. And, like, especially with the sixth or seventh round draft pick, if the Flames can get a defenseman with size and that and skating ability, then, you know, that would probably be uh, where I would go. Um, and I, and but, you can get good goalies in the seventh round. I mean, we're talking a lot about Wolf. Wolf was a seventh round pick in 2019. Yeah, exactly. Goalies, it really doesn't matter where you take them as long as you you know what you're getting, yeah. so to speak. Like, like you look at the uh, guys that have been taken in the first round, like Wallstead and uh, Vasilevsky. Like they both are look well. Wallstead, but I'd say for good. every good goalie in the first two rounds, there's five yeah. busts. Yeah, exactly. And then you look at guys like Spencer Knight or or uh, even. Um, Tyler Parsons, who was a early second round pick who flamed out or Mason McDonald, another early yeah. second round pick that, you know, so it's one of those where unless you know that the guy for sure is going to be dynamite, then don't go goalie in the first round or second round. Uh, but, you know, just keep 
plugging away. Uh, goalies are voodoo. You'll find somebody eventually. And, you know, even with, I mean, they've got a couple young goalies now. If the Flames want to take a year not taking goalies, I'd even be okay to swap said seventh round goalie pick with another defenseman. Yeah, same I think here. they've got a few young guys in the system that I think you could get away and say, okay, we don't need another one right away. Yeah. The only other thing that I could see realistically adding is if there's another small, uh, highly skilled offensive forward in the Matthew Phillips, Andrew Mangiapane type mold that might be available in the sixth or seventh round. Yeah. And, like, and again, that, I think you, then you could swap a goalie for that as opposed to a defenseman for that. Yeah. Exactly. Like, I think regardless, two of the five picks at, at least have to be defensemen and then, you know, play everything by ear after that. I agree. And Matt, you'd mentioned earlier, you know, the Flames potentially picking up another pick. Um, there's been a lot of talk this offseason about the Calgary Flames potentially wanting to move one of their expiring contracts or seven expiring contracts in a year. And the name that I would say has had the most talk lately is Noah Hannafin. And apparently Hannafin doesn't want to resign here. Uh, the Calgary flames are rumored to be listening to offers for him. What do you think the likelihood is that Hannafin moves to the draft? Uh, I think very likely, um, mainly because of the fact that uh, frankly, like the flames could retool on the fly um utilizing a draft like this one to springboard themselves um like you look at um other defensemen that have been traded like uh, the Provorov trade Provorov and Hannafin are pretty much interchangeable uh as in terms of talent and expected return and Provorov got a first and two second round draft picks and you know Hannafin could get the Flames like a 20 to 25 pick in this draft plus a good second round draft pick this year and perhaps one next year it, to me with the flames having uh, anderson uh, Weger, uh shillington tanev zadorov stetcher i'm assuming is going to come back you know like you have all of those guys like that's even without hannafin that's a really good defense core uh so you know like losing hannafin yeah it hurts but you know, having Shillington back, frankly, would fill up most of that void. And then, you know, you're getting a hot couple of high quality prospects into the system, which the Flames desperately need for not next season, but the year after. I know what you're saying about Hanovan being better, but I'm not sure we can compare the two trades as you know, apples to apples as you are. I think Hannafin's definitely better. I think the extra year of control and cost certainty from Provorov is probably worth something as well. You got to remember the Flyers got a lot of value in the deal by taking a cap dump from LA with Peterson. Um, so I think there's a lot more things in play in that one, but I could definitely see Hannafin. I don't know the flames are going to want to dump Hannafin for all picks like Philly did. I think they're two teams in different places, but I could see a first and a forward. Like a you yeah. know second third line forward a Dubé type uh, coming back. I don't think they need to get a defenseman back. I think, like you said, we have a good defense core, and I think if oh, no. if they if well, they sign Stetcher, they could fill whatever they need to in the free agent market. Yeah, what I'm kind of envisioning in that is the Flames actually getting a bit of a cap dump thrown their way in that trade, um, where the Flames could use another forward. And realistically, there, you know, like a, if you look at, like, say, um, Vancouver, not that this trade would make sense in that context, but like the Flames taking Connor Garland on. Say, I think they're going to want to shed money instead of take a dump, though. Oh, I know. It's one of those where you could potentially, like, reallocate Hannafin's money elsewhere with a similarly, like, a decent forward, like, Connor Garland is worth close to the money that he's making. And, you know, um, it's one of those, like, it, that could be a scenario where it's a three-way trade and the Flames taking the supposed cap dump on to get the extra assets out of the deal. But we'll see. It, it's, you know, there are lots of scenarios at, at play, and I think that whether, like, Elias Lindholm or Hannafin go, um, 
like to me this is the draft where like if you're gonna kind of like retool on the fly this is the draft to get as many picks as possible just because of the fact that the quality is there and even if you're not going to retool on the fly which we have no indication the team wants to do this is sort of your take on it um i think that even if you think you're a contender which all signs from the flames point to they do i think you could make that trade either way i think you could definitely get a lot of peace for the future i think you could also move hannafin for roster pieces like i think you can go either way with it depending on what you want to do yeah and i i can agree with that too and it, it it just to me it depends largely on uh uh what offers are available and you know like say like an elias lindholm you know like you could trade him to a number of teams and get a high quality prospect and pick package out of the deal um you know it just depends on the who's and the what's and we'll see um it'll be interesting and I, how do you say what i'm meaning by like retool on the fly it's not meaning like oh the flames are now going to just suck for another couple years and miss the playoffs like i would be firmly in the uh how to get better through like free agency or other trades where you might tra- take some prospect capital that you get in and flip it for different players uh, sort of like how uh, Washington traded or um, Orlov and uh, Hathaway for a first and then traded them for Sandine from Toronto, you know, basically shuffling the deck cards a bit, you know, deck chairs on the Titanic a bit mm-hmm. and, you know, getting what you need. Um, like, I, this, I think uh, any, if I'm doing the deal for Hannafin, I think it's got to be a first and something. Whether that something yeah. becomes a pick, whether that something becomes a prospect, or whether that something becomes a roster player, I think it's a 2023 first. You don't want to go next year. I think you want to capitalize on this good draft. Yeah, and exactly. something else. Yeah, and the and something else just depends on where that pick is in the draft. Yeah, and let's just say that if the Flames think that they could trade into the top ten with this, then I could see it being next year's. Like if you're trading them to a developing team. I'd be okay to swap it to another year because you're always going to get somebody good in the top 10. But I think, you know, the teams that they'd move them to would probably be between 11 and 32. Yeah. And realistically, like there are a bunch of teams where, you know, like a guy like Hannafin, uh, say like Pittsburgh, who picks, I do believe one pick ahead of the flames, uh, one for one with, that pick for Hannafin and then maybe add a small piece like a Pierre Oliver Joseph or a second round draft pick. I think that gets done. Um, you know, like there are lots of iterations where it just depends on exactly where that pick lands. Sure. Yeah. I think of those two, and I mean, we've heard other names to Foley and other guys, of all, let's say, the seven names, who do you think the most... I don't think you see this Flames team torn apart. I think one guy gets moved to the draft. No. Who do you think it is? Uh, I could see two... It, uh, frankly, it just depends on... Because Conroy, it obviously, is going to be asking each of the seven guys, are you going to more than likely re-sign with us? Um, and if that's a, I wouldn't be surprised if you even send him a contract now. Well, he technically can't until July 1st. So no, but you, you talk to them and you say, all right, are you willing to put your money where your mouth is now? Yeah. And like July 1st, sign it and we'll fax it in on the first. Yeah. And it's one of those where, you know, like say like Michael Backlund, if he really wanted out, then it would make sense to trade him now. If you know, and that goes with all seven of the guys, like if you can exact, returns for them now at or at the the trade deadline you know it's it just depends and there's always one or two big trades after july 1 when somebody doesn't get the player they wanted and has to go shopping for them so i think you know yeah okay i could see two of them i can't see more than four of these seven leaving Um, i mean that's a very different team if they do but my my prediction just solely a prediction is one one of the seven moves of the draft and then one of them probably moves in July. And that's a possibility. It'll be either one or two, and then nothing if it's two. 
I think that I think that Hannafin is the most likely to move at the draft. I think he's the easier deal to get done. Yeah, I agree. Lindholm is a uh, close second more t- if he doesn't want to Yeah, stay. more teams have a need for him right now, and then I think Lindholm is a guy that you're going to fight more to retain. Yeah. And I don't think they're going to want to move him yet because I think that they're going to fight longer to retain yeah. him. Yeah. Like, unless somebody offers you a top 10 pick for Lindholm, you say no. And... Yeah, and, and and I think the Lindholm deal, like you said, because it's not a top ten, which I doubt it would be, I think you want more time to negotiate that deal. Yeah, and realistically, like if they're close, like that'll get done. Um, and I think that like e- if both sides of the equation want some certainty, and I think the rest of the team, frankly, wants some certainty. Uh, so like I would not be surprised if like uh, how would you say? I don't think that Tanev will be back uh, after this season. Uh, regardless, I think that just due to age and stage, I think if he wanted to be back and he'd take a discount, they would. But he's so hurt, I think that you know he's probably done after. Yeah, this. Yeah, I agree, and that's where like reallocating money elsewhere, just uh, you know, even if that's great guy, I think you know if he was healthy, they'd bring him back. But... Yeah, it, it that might be a situation where you see uh, Poirier come up into the nhl and they reallocate dollars elsewhere uh depending yeah. but um you know of course maybe stone will take that role he's never leaving true uh zadorov i fully expect back um to fully i would expect back if the flames offer him term uh backland if he wants to be back he will if not he won't i think the ball is firmly in his court on that one uh, but I think Backlund will do like a Chuck. I have to imagine that Backlund, being a longtime Flame, will let the Flame shop him. Yeah. And Lindholm and Hannafin, I think, are both, you know, if they don't want to be here, they'll be gone before. I think Hannafin, I don't want to say is expendable, but I think that we have other options there. But I think with Lindholm, you probably go to him and say, look, we brought in a new coach. We brought in a new GM. These are the guys that you players wanted. We've done everything we need to do. You got to sign. Like, you know, I, I think that there might be a little bit of a breach of trust there if he doesn't. Yeah. yeah. Um. Well, it, realistically, if uh, Lindholm does go, like the Flames are looking at walking into the season with Kadri, Dubé, and um, Backlund as your top three centers, which you know, is doable, I, I but think, not great. I think that between Hannafin and Lindholm, you'd get another center. Yeah, I agree. Um, what do you think the likelihood is that Brad Living summons one of these guys for service in Toronto? I could see a Hannafin to Toronto for X making sense. I could see. I think of all these guys, I think Hannafin is the one that I think you'd see go over there. I could even see Lindholm as well. That, you know, because... Both those guys make sense, frankly. Uh, I think that Toronto has the assets to pull off the Lindholm or the Hannafin deal. I'm not sure they have the assets to pull off the Lindholm deal. Well, they would need to, honestly, they'd probably have to send Nylander back if they wanted Lindholm, um, just for cap savings purposes. Um, yeah, and I mean, even then, you know, Lindholm's got a modified no trade. I don't know if the Flames be on it or not. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. We don't want Yarn Croak back. I mean, really, they've got no forwards left after the season. The only forwards that Toronto has is Austin Matthews, John Tavares, Mitch Marner, William Nylander, Callie Yarn Croak, Sam Lafferty, and Matthew Nyes. Yeah. Not a great group. And of the defensemen, I mean, we're not getting Riley. We don't really want to take Giordano or Brody back. Um, so Jake McCabe. Yeah, I mean, that'd be good cost savings, and I could see maybe doing something that would involve him. Um, Lilligren and Connor Timmons. Like, they're, I think that they're short on assets to make high-end deals right now. I agree. So that's why I think they'd have the assets to pull off the Hannafin deal, because I think you could maybe take... Um, yeah, I mean, we won't we won't play, you know, fantasy GM, but I think if you did the Hannafin deal to Toronto, you'd get McCabe plus something. You'd kind of get that fill in defenseman at two million for two years. Yeah. Plus, you know, either a defend or a forward or a pick or something like that. Yeah, I agree. But you know, if you're dealing with tree, you're gonna have all sorts of conditions on those. Oh yeah, it'll be a phone book, which is always good. If the draft is on a Tuesday, it's a second. If it's on a Wednesday and it's raining, it's a third. If uh, yeah, I mean, it'll be it'll be crazy. 
If you but if I you're think, given a ticket for jaywalking to the arena for the draft, then it, you know you lose the conditional sixth. If if Tree decides to wear a pink tie on draft day, you move up three positions. If he decides a red tie, you move down. Um, yeah, all yeah, sorts be of crazy. Fun. But I think you know outside of just the first pick that the Flames fans get to watch on the twenty eighth, I expect a big trade. And I mean, we kind of had this expectation when Tree was our GM to expect a trade of the draft. I'm not expecting Connie to be that same way. I don't know if that's Connie's MO, but I expect that Connie will make one move. And if nothing else, I think it's almost a, you almost have to do it as a sign to the players. Look, this guy didn't want to commit. He's not here. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I agree. And that's where. You know, like that, the Flames need to do their due diligence, and you kind of gotta, you kind of gotta play chicken or call their bluff in a way. It's like this guy didn't want to commit, so he's not here. So are you gonna commit? Yeah, no, and that's where, you know, like honestly, if all seven of the players said that they wanted to be traded, you'd be looking at trading all seven, and uh, whether it's at the draft or. Yeah. during the season or in the off season, but you know it's and I don't think you're gonna move more than more than two of these guys no. um at least you know before the season starts no and I'm, I'm expecting the flames to once again steal the show at the draft floor like we have on a number of occasions so we'll see um i i would be frankly shocked if the flames made just their five selections yeah i mean even if you know even if we make a move and i think there's other minor moves you could make as well for other players but i would I think no matter what that move is, you're bringing draft picks back. Whether it's a first, a second, a third, a fourth, or a fifth, I think you need to be bringing picks back. Yeah, and frankly, like you're gonna like we saw that like Lucic is now open to talking to other teams. I think that you're gonna see a lot of the younger, older guys on the farm team start to graduate into the NHL on a full time basis next season. Um, the guys like Walker Dewar. Uh, Pospisil maybe, uh, you know, like the the door will be open for those kind of guys to take spots. So, um, it, it'll and I mean, I I could even see a guy like you know, I don't know what um Conrad's feelings on a guy like Rajichka is, but you could even potentially see Rajichka move for a, a fourth or a fifth. Like you know, I think there's a number of guys here that um you know Gilbert's got one more year. I could see him getting flipped for, you know, a late pick. Like, I think that there will be some roster movement, even if it's not all high-end roster movement. Yeah, and I think that as the team goes on, uh, you know, like, how would you say, it, as weird as it sounds, having Huberdo, Kadri, and Uyghur signed to long-term deals actually helps with the stability of the organization just because you have three main pieces there, even though, like, two of them kind of underperformed uh, well, Hoover Doe significantly underperformed last year, but um, those guys are you know are kind of like the the backbone of the team right now, and for sure, you know you can plug and play around them, and it's to kind of build to facilitate around those guys and the young and upcoming guys as well, and for sure, it'll it'll just now, be a lot no, of ha- interesting, you know backs and forth that as we get yeah. closer noah hannafin does have a modified no trade he has submitted an eight team no trade list but i imagine if he's told the flames which the rumor is he doesn't want to resign i imagine the team has that list right now. oh yeah and you'd have to imagine it would probably be west coast teams plus you know like say toronto or something like that yeah, and I mean, he is an American kid. He's from Boston, so I could even see that, you know, he him wanting to go back to the U.S. or, you know, East Coast. He could pull a Johnny where he wants to go East Coast and ends up in Columbus. Um, That'd be funny. But, you know, I could see him. I, I th- Yeah, we can talk more about this after the draft um, based on what happens, but I could see Seattle being a good landing place for him, though I don't know we want to do an interdivision trade, but... I mean, I could see, yeah, I think there's a, I think almost every team in the league would want to know a Hannafin. Yeah, exactly. And then to remember, he's 26. Like, he's still a very young defenseman. I think he's been around the league forever, but I think the Flames will get a premium in return because you're trading a 26 year old, not a 30 year old. Oh, for sure. And that's part of the reason why 
uh, frankly, I think that it makes more sense to trade him than even to keep him, even if he wanted to stay here, uh, due to the fact that, like, offensively, the Flames have three guys that are better offensively than he is on the blue line, and he's right in the same group defensively as all of those guys. So, like, even him showcasing himself, like, he's not able to be, like, the power play guy, you know, where on some teams, like, he would be the power play guy. And, um, you know, like, Anderson, uh, Weger, and Shillington are all significantly better than him offensively. And that's just yeah. due to the Flames having a... I think if there's one piece a... you can move out and not miss it as much as Tim. If we move Lindholm, we're going to miss that piece. Oh, for sure. Any of the forwards, I, and really, I, like, we're... Yeah. And I don't want to say that we won't miss Hannafin, but I think he's the easier piece to replace right now. Yeah, it's sort of like if the Flames were to trade Vladar, another guy that we haven't talked about, but, you know, the, a doable... And that's another pick I don't think gets made of the draft. I think the Vidar pick gets made in the summer when some team realizes we couldn't get the guy we wanted as a UFA. Let's go talk to Calgary. Yeah, and I I could realistically see getting a third or something for him, but um, you know, like. And again, maybe you get that this year, but I could, I I think the Vidar deal. If if they want to make it at the draft again, that's I think one of your better assets to move for a pick this year. But I can see him being moved for a pick next year. Yeah, it's one of those where. Um, in both with Hannafin and with uh, Vladar, there is enough quality in the position where losing that particular piece, while it hurts, it, it's not, you know, like you've cut that hole and made a hole in the organization due to their departure. Quality of gold hunting. You're talking about Oscar Dansk, right? Yeah, everybody dances now, you know. There you go. Don't howl at the goalie, dance. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well matt i think that probably wraps up our draft episode we're going to do things a little bit differently this year than we usually do just because the draft is so close to free agency we're not going to put out a post-draft pre-free agency episode we will come back in early july after the canada Day long weekend and we will wrap up both what the flames have done in the draft and whatever happens at the opening of free agency. We just thought that with the short timeline and with the flames not expected to make a huge splash July one, this is probably better for everybody. Yeah. And realistically, uh, July 1st for every team in the NHL this year is going to be kind of a disappointment because there are not too many good players. Uh, basically it's Tyler Bertuzzi and yeah, <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and I think the Flames will make their big splash to the draft, and I think coming in early July will let us talk, let us have some time to reflect on that as pundits and fans. And, I mean, may maybe the Flames make a huge splash like they did last year and they bring in Kevin Rooney again. Oh, goody. Yeah. You know, uh, but and That was our July 1st, you know, splash well, honestly, last year. Honestly, I could see the Flames adding a depth defenseman or a depth forward. Um, but, yeah, like, realistically, like, the Flames, they're – uh, forward and uh, defense to be uh, free agents are mostly fourth line guys. Uh, Troy Stetcher is the only important defenseman that's uh, walking to free agency, and Matthew Phillips, who may or may not be back, just you know. So, and and even if they add a depth guy, I think it'll be later. I don't think it'll be on the first. No, uh, it would probably be a defensive depth if they were wanting to go that route and that's also a position that they could easily bring in through trade um you know if they're making a trade so i think we'll have to see what shakes out there before we know what happens in july but you and i'll come and talk about it once it's happened in early july yep so matt enjoy the draft as always it's two days we have round one on june 28th we have round two on the 29th um and it's uh, it's going to be an interesting draft for Flames fans. We have the um, we have the award ceremony right in there, so we have a couple things going on between now and then. But enjoy the draft, enjoy the awards, and enjoy your Canada Day weekend. Yep. And as always, go Flames, go! Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.